It started about two months ago as a tightness in my chest, a feeling like I'm not breathing as well as normal. It's getting a little harder to breathe, but I kind of brushed it off as stress because there are some hard things going on in my life. And then the chest pain started getting worse and the breathing started getting a little harder. And then it started creeping up into my throat. And a few days ago, I entered a, an anxiety attack, maybe not a full-blown panic attack, but my version of it. And what that feels like to me is my throat just gripped like somebody is somebody has me by the throat. It's an intense throat pain, actually. It really hurts, but it's like deep on the inside, not like on the outside. And the breathing is even harder. I just feel like I can't I can't take anything in and I can't let anything go. Um, letting go feels even harder. Uh, the chest pain is still there, but it's uh, not as noticeable to me. And then my entire body feels flooded with just that anxiety, right? That, that fear, that panic. It's an indistinguishable panic. What, is, what am I panicking about, about? I look around and I have a roof over my head and there's enough money in the bank to feed myself right now. It's not imminent you know, there's no imminent danger. I'm looking around, there's no imminent danger, and yet my body is panicking. So hey, my name is Alicia, and in this video, I am going to describe to you what I do, or what I did in this instance anyway, when I'm feeling all that anxiety and that panic and that terror and the throat gripping, because uh, I like to look at these things a little differently. I like to actually welcome what's happening and use what's happening as an opportunity to let go of an old pattern or identify a wound I haven't tended to or something, right? Like my orientation here and everything I like to teach online is about listening to the body and letting that message come through so I don't have to keep repeating this pattern because frankly, I'd really like to not repeat anxiety. Um, and I am not sharing this as a doctor. I'm not sharing this as an anxiety expert. And if you're looking for some kind of like five-step anxiety management quick quick video, this isn't that. Uh, this is going to be really personal. It's going to require that I share some of my story, some of my history that involves sexual trauma, just so you know. Um, and I'm deconstructing what happened by pulling on this thread of anxiety and the physical sensations my body is giving me. One option we all have when these things come up, whether it's an anxiety attack, a panic attack, um, just stress or pain or a traumatic memory or an emotion we don't really enjoy feeling, one option we all have um, is to kind of, uh, you know, to resist it, to, to convince ourselves we shouldn't be feeling it or there's no reason to be feeling it right now. In the case of me with this anxiety, one option I had was to actually look around and go, well, why are you panicking? You know, God, this is so, I don't want to feel this right now. This is so dumb. Like I'm going to, you know, I have a roof over my head. I have food to eat today. You know, nothing, nothing crazy is happening to me. Like I'm not getting attacked. I'm not, you know, like I'm just sitting here in my hotel room trying to work, right? We can rationalize away what's happening uh, and then try to manage it, right? take some deep breaths, go for a walk. Um, and management can come in helpful. So I'm not saying it's not useful sometimes, but I hate managing pain. I never want to manage it. I want to get rid of it. I want to find the root cause and rewire and change the patterns. So I'm going to describe to you uh, what came up for me as I journeyed into my panic and the sensations in my body and learned something about myself that I'd kind of been I don't know, maybe refusing to fully own up to now. So in January of 2021, my partner, Stefan, and I were living in Durango, Colorado, and we wanted to move to Austin, Texas, but we weren't sure when we were going to get out of our lease. And then our landlord called us and said, I found a tenant. You can move out by the end of the month. And basically we had two months or two weeks to pack the house and, um, and come down to Austin really unexpectedly. Uh, so I'm filming this video in Austin, Texas right now in a hotel room, and we've been here since the end of January. We arrived uh, full of optimism and excitement to be here at uh, Durango, Colorado, while very beautiful, um, hadn't really felt like home to us. 
And we've been searching for home for three years now. So just to give a little bit of backstory. And we arrived in Austin, um, ready to find a home and, you know, considered buying. And the market here is just a little crazy. And that didn't feel feasible on the timeline we're at. We really needed to get into a home right away, or at least we wanted to. Uh, and so we started looking for rentals. And I've never, I've lived a lot of places in the United States, um, and I've never lived somewhere where you have to have a real estate agent to look at houses um, to rent. Um, and, but that's how it is in Texas. You have to actually find an agent and, you know, get them the rentals you'd like to see. Uh, and then they show them to you and the agents make a commission. So, you know, we were working with an agent, but I felt pressured to choose something really quickly uh, because, you know, he's not going to make a big commission. He would certainly make a lot more on a house sale. And I kind of just started getting the feeling, you know, and you can just feel something that he was kind of over it. Like we'd looked at five, six, seven houses and I didn't like any of them. And I just kind of got the feeling he's over it. So we started working with another agent and, you know, I basically started to feel like this is really, I don't have a lot of choice here, or at least I don't feel like I do. Like this isn't, I don't feel free. I want to be free to look at a hundred houses if I want to before deciding which one I want to live in because where I live is really important to me. And so this started to feel really frustrating and really constricting. I didn't feel like I had choice, like the amount of choice I wanted to have around it. Um, but, you know, we'd committed to being here and we just felt like, well, we got to get into something, you know. And one house that we looked at um, happened to just feel a little easier. It was an owner agent of the house instead of an agent. Um, and getting in to see it felt really easy. And uh, we walked in to look at it while the current tenants were actually in it. They were trying to break their lease. Um, and that felt almost kind of synchronous. And uh, we had to wear face coverings. So... If you saw my video last year, you might know that I really haven't been wearing masks this whole time, which is another thing I, you know, and maybe the theme of this video will be really apparent to you and you'll learn this about me really well. I like freedom. I like choice. I like bodily sovereignty. I've earned the right to say, yes, I, I want to do this to my own body or no, I don't. Um, so I haven't really been wearing masks. I don't like to. I don't like to wear anything over my mouth. I like to breathe oxygen. I don't like to rebreathe my CO2. Um, and yet we had to, you know, and so I was like, okay, I'll put it on. And I was wearing a scarf uh, over my mouth and nose. And the tour was really quick, quick. I kind of wanted to get out of there, but we thought we, you know, we liked it good enough. It wasn't like an amazing home, but we liked it good enough. We signed a lease and, um, but we couldn't move in for two weeks. So we were still living in a hotel. And meanwhile, there are all these other things kind of happening simultaneously. There's a lot going on and I'm not going to go into all of it, but Stefan and I were having um, a lot of hard conversations. Uh, one of the topics coming up for us right now is around having kids. I will be 41 this year and don't know if we're going to have kids. I don't, you know, I don't know. It's still an unknown. Um, I want the choice to have kids when I feel ready and I don't feel ready but I'm going to be 41. And so I'm starting to feel like I, I'm not going to have the choice to have kids the way I want to this lifetime. So that's in the mix here. And you're probably starting to see the theme here, right? It's around choice. When I don't feel like I have choice, I start to feel boxed in. I start to feel trapped. I start to feel constricted. And that constriction actually manifests in my body. Now, at the same time that all of this is going on, I feel acutely aware of how few friends I have to reach out to right now in my life. It's been also one of the themes of my life that I've moved so many times um, that friendships, lasting friendships have been really rare. Um, I also have a way of being a really confronting person and not a lot of people like being around that. <laughs> Um, and that has gotten in the way of me maybe being friends with the people I should be because I temper my confrontation, or my confrontational self sometimes, but then I'm not being my authentic self. So I'm not blaming anyone else. I think it's actually a byproduct of me somewhere believing I can't be myself and have friends. Um, and so feeling like I want to talk to somebody about this, but there's no one I can even reach out to and feeling friendless and choiceless around that. And um, some of you may know from some stories I've told on this channel that uh, 
almost two years ago, about a year and a half ago, I guess, um, I stopped talking to my parents. And uh, six months before that, I stopped talking to other family members. Um, and I recently reconnected with my mom a little bit, but it's, you know, she's not necessarily somebody while this was happening that I would reach out to when I'm going through a hard time. So now I'm suddenly feeling like I, I don't even have a choice of like someone to talk to about this, right? And it's building up and it's building up and we finally get the keys to move into this new house and we, I walk in, Stefan actually wasn't there when I got there. Uh, I, he had already unloaded a U-Haul the night before, before he got there before me. Um, and then I walked in the next day and he wasn't there and I immediately smelled something familiar that I don't like, that my body started reacting to, that I didn't smell when we looked at it before because my face was covered and all of their belongings were in the house. And my first thought is I'm pretty sure this is mold. And two years ago, I was poisoned by black mold, actually, in Stefan's parents' house when I visited them for Christmas. They found the black mold, so this was not just theoretical. They found the black mold and had to do remediation for it. And I got violently, violent, like the most violently ill I've ever been in my life for one night. Like my body just was like, no way, I'm purging that shit, it's getting out. Um, my body has a tendency to talk to me really fast, which I love, but it's also, you know, kind of a curse. <laughs> like I feel things really strongly and I feel them fast and other people aren't feeling them as fast as me. And so it can create conflict with the people I'm doing life with. I say to Stefan, I, I don't know if I can live here. Like, I don't, I don't, th I think I'm going to get really sick here. I think I'm going to, you know, spiral into a hole of depression and maybe not even want to live. Like, that's not really who I am. I love life. Like, I'm a playful person. I'm curious and passionate. I like adventure. I like, I don't know, I love life. Um, but just voicing that out loud, it's like, that's what I was feeling in that moment. And we're both weary. It's been two months of living in hotels and not having a house. And, um, you know, and the initial reaction is, really? Like, can't we get an air filter? Like, can't this work? And I start looking around the house trying to find the source of it, you know, because I'm, part of me is like trying to rationalize, well, maybe you could live here. But then this other part is saying, you know, but there's, there's something here, you know, there's something here. I feel it. I feel it. And I actually found some like mold. I don't know if it's called a colony, <laughs> um, a, 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 a growth of mold in the kitchen windowsill. Um, and that was it for me. It's like, nope, no way. Nope. I'm not going to live here. Um, I'm not going to say that was an easy decision. I broke down bawling my eyes out and feeling again, choiceless because probably we we're going to have to forfeit the thousands of dollars we just paid in the deposit. Um, you know, I haven't, in my experience, you know, landlords aren't that helpful when you point out that their home is poisonous. Um, which really sucks. I am actually so passionate about toxicity and being aware of it. And I wish we could talk about it with anyone without people taking it personally or feeling like maybe I'm going to sue them. I'm not, um, or anything like that. Uh, but yeah, we had to get out of our lease that we had just signed, forfeit the money, move all of our stuff back into storage. And that's when my panic attack started, my anxiety. Um, and all, at the same time as all of this, we're trying to figure out how to make a living, um, you know, which is slightly awkward to talk about here on YouTube <laughs> because uh, you're part of my community. Some of you join courses of mine um, and I don't want it to feel weird, uh, but it's been challenging the last four years to figure out how to make consistent income in this online world. And we've had some really great successes. Uh, but not the success we were looking for three years ago when he quit his job to help me. Um, and our plan three years ago was he was going to quit his job. We were going to make it happen in like a year or two and then have kids. Um, and it hasn't happened. So all of that's in the mix. And how do we make, you know, how do we make this a success so that we can have a family, so that we can actually make a really good living helping people online. Um, and so financial stress is coming into the picture and 
boom, gripping in my throat. The panic is setting in for real now. And this, this right here just has my attention. It's so constricting. I feel like I can't breathe. And it's at the same time, it's not just about not being able to breathe. It is painful. It's painful right here. It feels like somebody is strangling my vocal cords from the inside. As this is setting in and as it's intensifying and intensifying and intensifying, I'm, I'm watching it. I'm actually able to watch it. I'm practiced at observing myself and letting it happen and, and then following the threads and actually getting curious about what's happening instead of reactive. And so I start getting really curious, maybe aggressively curious. Why is this happening? I remember asking Stefan sitting on the, the hotel bed, why, why is this happening? Like, why, you know, why is this anxiety happening? Like it's got, it's telling me something. What, what is this? Um, but I, I watched my mind also, and my mind was making up stories that my world was getting smaller and smaller and smaller and closing in on me. And my choices were getting fewer and fewer and worse and worse. And basically that is the pattern for me around anxiety is I start to feel like any choice I make at this point, like somehow I've, I've been, I've been cornered by life somehow or found or backed myself into a corner. I, you know, I don't know, I'm not blaming anyone, but somehow I've been cornered into a situation where there are no good choices. That's, and I, and I watched myself saying that to myself and to Stefan even about our living situation about our work options, about everything, about our relationship. I mean, this pattern is pervasive when this is happening. But I also observed that this is familiar. Not only is that mind chatter familiar, that's actually not the most important part. The constriction is familiar. The panic is familiar. The feeling of someone kind of grabbing my throat and this chest tightness, all of this is familiar. I've felt it before. I've been here before and my body seems to be asking me to remember something or let go of something or make something conscious, you know? And what I'm seeing as this is happening is I'm also aware because I've worked on myself so much that this story of choicelessness or that there are no good choices is bullshit. There are good choices. I know that. Why? Because I believe there are a million choices that we can't even see. And some of them have to be good choices, good options. Um, but in this moment, that didn't feel like the most useful thing. And I think that this is maybe where I can be helpful if you also experience anxiety or panic or the feeling of being trapped in your own body or constricted in any way, right? It's similar, kind of similar themes here is that I could have used my mind in that moment to come up with some choice and rationalize why it's a good one. Instead though, I wanted to look at why I have this pattern of getting to the place where I feel like I have no good choices. And this is where my story comes in and it feels important to share this so that it really makes sense. And I invite you as you're listening to this uh, to consider your own story, you know, of, of where have you felt those sensations before? Where have you felt maybe the emotions or the feelings of anxiety or panic? But in particular, I think it's useful to actually look at the physical, the physical sensations, the actual images maybe that are coming to mind when you feel into your body and the sensations it's giving you in these moments, because somewhere it's like there's an imprint of that. And where did it imprint? What experience imprinted this on us, you know? And I think it's important to pull on these threads. So I want to give you an example of where this pattern comes from for me, this pattern of feeling choiceless and feeling trapped, because it's kind of like, or maybe exactly like the past playing out in the present. 
and your story is going to look different, but perhaps the pattern is similar if you experience something like I'm describing when I describe the way I feel anxiety um, and that feeling of being trapped or choked. And the sensations are really familiar, right? So what I do um, in these moments where something really intense is happening, like anxiety, which I haven't felt actually in a really long time, like since since 33, um, but uh, is I trace it back. I trace it back to, you know, through my life to kind of go, okay, like that's the pattern. I want to trace it to its root because the fact that this is happening is telling me I, I haven't rewired this pattern. I haven't, there's some part of me that still is carrying the story physiologically anyway, that I often don't have any good choices. Um, so the example I'm going to give you, and you'll have your own version of this in your life, but, <clears throat> and there are many examples for me actually of choicelessness in my childhood, but the biggest one is that I was targeted when I was 13 years old by a 30 year old psychopath <clears throat> who um, groomed me for six months and turned me against myself and my family. Um, I don't remember the first time I had sex and this whole thing with him lasted two and a half years before I summoned the courage to say no to him. I'm done. I'm not doing this thing anymore. Um, and throughout that time, I was aware somewhere in me, like, you know, maybe not every day, but I was aware that I had a choice of telling someone. I could choose to tell my parents. I could choose to tell someone else that this was going on and I chose not to. And that choice of not to has haunted me and I've healed it now, you know, um, I know why I didn't do that. Uh, but often our not saying no can haunt us, but at the same time, um, or not speaking up, right? But at the same time, if we look back, there's probably a really, really, really wise reason I didn't speak up and I didn't tell anyone. And what I know now looking back for sure is that if I had told somebody that this was happening, even worse pain would have happened for me. You know, maybe I'd be the laughing stock of my school. Maybe people would call me a slut and a whore or make fun of me. I don't really know, you know, but, but just kind of looking back, I'm pretty sure that could have happened um, in my high school or, you know, it's a small, it was a small town, you know, people would have gossiped. I would have been known as the target of the psychopath, or maybe I would have been, you know, blamed or called, you know, I don't know that I seduced him. Right. There are all kinds of things could have happened. Um, what I know for sure within my family unit is that it would have enraged my father, uh, in such a way that I don't, I might've felt unsafe in my own home. Um, and I don't, yeah, I, there's just no good choices. Right. So I didn't say anything. I endured it, you know, until I couldn't. And then I dealt with it with him, but I didn't tell anyone and not telling anyone didn't feel like a good choice, but it didn't feel like I could. So it's this like soup <laughs> you're swimming in soup. I'm, I feel like I'm swimming in of like, there are no good choices and anywhere I go, there's a bad consequence. So now bringing it back to the present and to a couple days ago when I was in this panic and gripping and anxiety, what was actually happening in, in those moments for the last day or two is Stefan and I were working on business plans and we were talking about different courses we might want to launch or a membership we might want to create for you. Um, and none of them felt like good, good choices. <laughs> and I noticed myself just ping ponging back and forth between ideas, driving Stefan crazy, driving myself crazy, um, my mind convincing me that none of these things were good choices, that doom, impending doom loomed on the other side of any choice I made um, in business, you know, which is our survival and our ability to feed ourselves and get a home somewhere. Um, and suddenly it hits me. I... <laughs> I'm ping-ponging back and forth between two different states of fear. It's not just panic and anxiety. And this distinction, I believe, could really help those of you suffering also from anxiety attacks. At least that's my hope. If it helps even one person, I would be so incredibly happy. 
So if what I'm about to share lands for you and feels like it's a breakthrough in your own experience of anxiety, I would love to hear that. <clears throat> I end up ping-ponging back and forth between panic and anxiety and terror. So when I'm in panic and anxiety, I actually can't grab thoughts. It's like I can't, I can't hold on to a single thought, and when I can't hold on to my thoughts, I panic. But then I get out of that state, and I enter a state where I am able to have some thoughts, but I'm in terror. I, I'm recognizing terror in myself, and I'm terrified I'm going to make the wrong choice. I look at all the choices in front of me. My thoughts are actually moving really quickly, um, but they're clear, and it's like massive indecision and self-doubt and terror. There are no good, you know, any choice is a bad choice. None of these, mm -mm, no, 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 terror, terror, terror. Okay, ping pong back to, if you don't, you know, you know what leads me to anxiety is if you don't make a choice, you're gonna be homeless and have no food. And then boom, anxiety. So ping ponging, ping pong, it's like back and forth. Terror, no good, no good choices. If I don't make a choice, I'm gonna, I'm gonna die. But then that pings me back to anxiety. And then I have it. I, one of the things I've been teaching online comes to help me and awareness. That I am ping-ponging back and forth between fear of pain and fear of freedom. And maybe this is a new concept for you, the idea that you could be afraid of freedom. Uh, but I believe actually that most of us are more afraid of freedom than pain because the pain we're used to is familiar. And the nervous system loves what is familiar and the nervous system prioritizes survival above thriving and it will always orient towards the familiar as the safe choice. The unknown is terrifying to the nervous system. Terrifying. Terrifying is the perfect word. It's terror inducing. Your body thinks you're going to die if you make this choice. So if you're ever feeling terror specifically, if it really feels like terror to you and not panic or anxiety, you're probably moving towards something that would break a pattern and you might be moving towards freedom. The freedom to be yourself, the freedom to speak your truth, the freedom to you know, live a stable life, the freedom to choose your own career, whatever the case may be. I'm ping-ponging back and forth between fear of pain, fear of freedom. Whew. Okay, a little bit of a breakthrough here. I am someone who wants freedom. I always want to move towards freedom. I am totally willing to feel terror if it means I can be a free human being. What the heck am I afraid of while having these conversations about finances, money, projects, the future? I'm afraid we'll actually make enough money that I'll be stable for the first time in my life, in my entire life. I'm afraid if we make that kind of money that is potentially possible, I will have to decide to have a baby and I'm terrified. Terrified to have a baby. I'm afraid if we make that kind of money, I'll have to make the decision of are Stefan and I working or am I leaving him and never having kids? Like, are we gonna work out and have kids or am I leaving, are we breaking up? You know, it's not like just me. Um, I'm terrified of letting go. I'm terrified of actually being able to relax for the first time in my life. Why? Relaxation is really unfamiliar. I'm really familiar with chaos, pain, hard work, enduring, you know, grinding, doing hard things. I'm really familiar with that. I'm not very familiar with the idea that I can live the kind of lifestyle I am moving towards. The familiar is, you know, chaos, is always living on the edge of things, always kind of in survival on some level, right? And so as you're standing on the cliff of maybe making a new choice for yourself for the first time in your life, that nervous system, voice, feeling, sensation, all of it can come in and try to convince you that this thing you're about to do is absolutely insane, or it might show up as resistance. I don't like that idea. I don't want to do that. Uh. <laughs> That's how it shows up for me. It's like a little girl, mm, but I don't want to. I don't want to do that. And I noticed myself feeling that way when we were talking about work projects that were the most financially viable. Isn't that interesting? So this is the breakthrough that 
I came to and we came to and Stefan and I also had an amazing breakthrough, I think, with him related to it, which I'm not going to go into because this video could get really long. Um, but that's mostly what I wanted to share with you about the breakthrough of realizing what's actually happening and this ping-ponging. But something even more extraordinary happened in the following day and a half since having that experience that I'm kind of like, whoa. Is what I'm feeling even mine? Because <laughs> it might not be, it might not actually be mine. And this is something I think universally we're susceptible to as human beings. This is my shit. This is, I'm, my body's feeling this, so it is mine. There must be something wrong with me. I must be going through something. Maybe I'm sick. Maybe I'm mentally ill. Maybe I'm defective. Maybe I'm broken. I've, there probably aren't that many other people feeling the same thing. Me, 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 right? We really tend to make things about us. I want to share real quick that studies have been done um, on, this is horrible that they really do this, but on rats and mice that show you could electrocute a rat while feeding it a carrot, and for four generations after that rat had that experience, they can put a carrot in the cage, not even electrocute them, and for four generations later, those rats will jump at the smell of a carrot, okay? We pass things on generationally that we don't deal with. I'm 100% convinced of that. And I've been talking to my mom a little bit. Those of you that know my story and maybe were following me the last few years might know that I stopped talking to my parents a while back, but I am actually talking to my mom again, um, just my mom. She has met me in some of my requests uh, for how I want to do relationship. And it's been a really beautiful reconnection the last really just couple of months. Um, but we haven't talked that much and we haven't talked that in depth and she hasn't, it hasn't really been like a big breakthrough kind of thing until yesterday. <laughs> I'm flabbergasted. I'm truly floored at what has happened because my mom reached out to me and shared after I sent my newsletter because she reads these news newsletters and watches these videos shared that she had been just going through her own panic attack, like the same, you know, an anxiety and a, her throat gripping. And she, the way she described it is I just can't exhale no matter what. It's like, I can't get a breath out. Um, and she had been sharing with me a few days ago before this, that she's learning, um, respectful confrontation and that she's been practicing it with a few people in her life, which is a really big deal for her using her voice and speaking up. Um, and for her to describe going through that, I mean, literally, she was literally going through that and then had a humongous breakthrough of her own around her own childhood trauma. So just a little bit of backstory on this is that I um, have really longed to have these kinds of conversations with both my parents or, you know, hopefully just even one of them would be nice about their own childhood trauma and the patterns that have shaped them and just imagining how amazing it would be if we could share in those stories and cry together and laugh together and heal together. Um, but my, my family really hasn't been up for that um, until my mom it seems up for it now. And so she's having an experience of looking at her own childhood trauma and patterns now for the first time and com started using her voice. She's starting to feel emotions for the first time that she maybe has suppressed or wasn't ready to feel. And um, we spoke on the phone yesterday and the floodgates opened and she started crying with me about things, you know, that happened to her in her childhood. And what I, I guess what I want to share right now is this image she shared with me just this morning before I filmed this video. I read her email um, and it was about uh, her. She grew up with a father who belted her and her brothers and um and my mom is like a pretty sensitive person and um very you know impacted by violence and um 
she just just described like she's this breakthrough she had she has she's having right now with her physiology um she's she's always had neck pain she's always had neck stuff and neck tension and um and trouble speaking up you know standing up for herself verbally um and she tends to dissociate when confrontation happens um, these are all things I've observed about her, but she maybe didn't have the self-awareness of because she was dissociating. And now she's having the self-awareness and she's describing where she believes it came from, which is that, you know, starting when she was just three, four, four years old um, as a little girl being belted by her dad when she would misbehave and it would, you know, just be for things like playing too loudly. And she was told she was to be seen and not heard. Um, and she described, remember, you know, this me physical memory of going through that, telling herself, just brace yourself you'll, and you'll get through it. And she would shrug her shoulders up to her ears, close her eyes and, and clench her jaw really tightly while the belt would hit her bare butt. And I just, this image just was heartbreaking to me to think about my mom going through that, knowing my mom. And, you know, I think it happened consistently enough that she just leaves when hard things happen and, and wasn't there for me when hard things were happening for me. And she acknowledged that yesterday in a really beautiful way. And I'm so grateful that I get to have this experience of talking to my mom in this way and her sharing these things with me. Uh, but just that image she shared of her body and what her body was doing. One thing that Gabor Mate teaches, who I really love, if you're interested in, you know, if you haven't heard of him and you're interested in healing trauma, he's a wonderful resource. But one of the things he shares is that we inherit the stress memories of our parents if they don't process it and move through it. And I just wonder if like, because I've had this pattern of bracing and letting go and enduring and not speaking up myself my whole life. And my neck is the tightest part of me. It's what has, if you've been following my other videos on pelvic instability, it's what it inhibits my deep core and compensates for it. And just, it's just, I'm just odd, you know, like what? is happening right now <laughs> like that my mom was going through that while I was going through it and now she's having a breakthrough and I feel like I had the breakthrough of moving to freedom for the first time in my life and like maybe my mom somehow psychically gave me the gift of her processing that so I didn't have to carry it I mean I've been doing so much of my own work and you know trying to unburden myself and unburden myself and whew, I yeah I wasn't expecting to have that piece of the story to tell you when I initially shared on Monday that I was gonna film this video. So what I wanna come back to here in wrapping this up is that fear of pain versus fear of freedom concept. Because what I want you to take away from this video is that really, in my experience, the choice is this is gonna hurt if you go this way and it's gonna hurt if you go that way. Maybe not physically, but you're either gonna get anxiety and, and panic or terror. <laughs> Which would you choose? <laughs> um, and why? Well, you're gonna have your own version of freedom, right? Maybe you are really good at speaking up, you know, and that's not your pattern, but something else is your pattern. Maybe it's more around finances or your, you know, relationships or health or, you know, something else. Um, but our freedom really will ask of us to do things we've never done, to be someone we've never been, to, to not do the patterned behaviors that we're so used to, to doing. And so you might begin to move towards something that would interrupt those patterns and begin to feel a little terror. And then perhaps that pings you into anxiety and panic like me. Um, but I think it could be really useful to realize that if you're feeling terror, because you're moving towards something you actually want or you feel resistance even though the thing you're looking at could give you what you've always said you've wanted. Consider for a moment that it might be fear of freedom and that the price of freedom might actually be the willingness to feel terror and do it anyway. So thank you so much for watching this video. I want to just say that 
we're not alone. You're not alone. I'm not alone. This topic seems to have, you know, struck a chord. And a lot of people are saying, like, thank you for sharing this because I know I'm not alone. Or, you know, thank you for being willing to, you know, not be perfect on YouTube <laughs> and pretend that everything's great. Um, I personally believe we're all suffering pretty dramatically, actually, in ways that if we were willing to share would open our hearts and help us connect. I hope that's how you feel in watching this video is not alone and more connected maybe to me or to yourself or to some concepts that could be really useful to you. And I'd love to hear from you. So your comments mean the world to me. It's the fuel that keeps me going. I like connecting with you. I like getting to know you. I don't want to do this journey alone. I don't want you to do this journey alone. And I only know you're there if you comment. Um, the thumbs ups are really nice and I would love that too. Uh, but they don't tell me who thumbs ups. You know, who does the thumb thumbs ups? Is that a word? I'd love a comment. So if this struck a chord with you, please share a comment below. I will meet you in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon.